Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 94. He is back on the show, Dave Bryan. I'm a, I am Alex Kazora, Steelers Depot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Monday, Steelers Nation. And Dave Bryan is back from his grand tour of America all over the East Coast. Had some time with our Ross McCorkle and Joe Clark, but he's back in the Las Vegas division of the Steelers Depot Metroplex, and we're glad to have him here. Dave, welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, if I, I probably sound a lot worse than I actually feel, but uh, I, generally when I get out there uh, uh, flying like that during the off season at all, uh, maybe I think I was punched in the face too much as a kid, uh, got sinus problems and all like that, and uh, just get back to this dry area, <laughs> all of it starts draining back and all. So I apologize if I sound like crap. Uh, today, most people probably say I sound like crap all the time, so <laughs> may- maybe it's not too noticeable there. But uh, yeah, I had a good trip, went down south back home to Pensacola for a few days and then went uh, over to Nashville. Oh, Alex, you got to get to uh, get to Nashville. You get in a lot of trouble in Nashville uh, <laughs> there. A lot of good music there. Uh, and then uh, from uh, Nashville, went over to up up to Boston and uh, it is cold up in Boston. I can confirm that, but uh, had a good time up there. There with uh, with Joe Clark, but uh, uh, all in all, had a, had a very solid trip, and and you know primarily wanted to spend time with with Ross McCorkle and Joe Clark, and got that done, and uh, got some sightseeing in, and and tours in along the way, and uh, back in Vegas, and uh, just in time to talk about some uh, some some you know uh, very significant news at that. Yeah, it's been a pretty busy week overall, but glad you're back, and I think. Two Men with Sinus Problems was the working title of the podcast oh. before we decided to be terrible podcast. But yeah, it's been a you know, pretty steady, busy week, slow weekend overall. No big news from the last show that Josh and I had, except for, I said, well, no, actually, I, I scratched that. There, there has one piece of big news that certainly came in on Friday, getting my timeline corrected. So let, let's start there with kind of the, the most topical and recent news, and then we'll kind of backtrack to the news over the past week. And I want to get your input on things like the salary cap and um, uh, Patrick Peterson's comments and those types of things. But certainly the big news here for Pittsburgh on this Monday that occurred on Friday was center Mason Cole released by the Pittsburgh Steelers entering the third year of his contract. He will not see it. Team starter in 2022 and 2023. Big regression last year for Mason Cole in 2023. Not sure why, but it certainly was evident. I thought there was still a pretty good chance they would pick up that roster bonus and keep him as that almost veteran bridge option while they look probably pretty heavily in the draft for a center. But certainly now that Cole has been released, center is arguably the top need for this team. And you can expect this team to draft one pretty high come April. Yeah, I think it's uh, the, it's less surprising that he's actually out the door. Uh, kind of wondered if that would be the end result by the time we got to uh, week one of the 2024 season. Uh, the timing more than anything, obviously, we've talked about that, uh, what, million and a half roster bonus that he was due and how he was going to be a guy that you're going to have to look hard and heavy at uh, in the early portion of the offseason to see if you did want to at least retain him uh, to get you past uh, maybe the time where, you know, the the, 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 the draft has come and gone and all like that. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's also no sense in throwing, you know, more bad money after, after, after good, so to speak there. So, uh, I think the most surprising, uh, aspect of this and the timing of it is generally you don't see the Steelers open up huge holes on their roster, uh, really at any point of an off season and, and specifically ahead uh, of, of the draft there. Uh, now they, there is still time for them to close that hole, uh, before the draft with some sort of free, a veteran free agent, uh, add at the center position, or maybe perhaps they, uh, they, they, they take more, uh, comfort in, 
in guys with experience, uh, with some experience on the roster at center in, in, in Nate Herbig and, you know, James Daniels is, is, is another guy that's got some experience at center. And obviously Spencer Anderson, there was talk about uh, him coming out of college as well, too. So maybe that's what they're relying on uh, to, to kind of cover them in the meantime. Uh, all that being said, I still think there's a decent chance that this team adds a very, very low dollar uh, veteran center uh uh, during free agency or before the draft. And then, uh, you know, look, uh, uh, he, he, regardless of what would have happened to Mason Cole, whether it be now or later, uh, I think all of us are most listening to this show. And I know most of us uh, at, at the site uh, really expected this team to draft a center uh, mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. So, you know, once again, it's not, it's not the surprising aspect that Cole's out the door. It's just, the, the fact that it when it's happening and kind of the hole it leaves is kind of a little bit uncharacteristic for this team. Right. And I think, and I certainly would agree that they're not going to, there's going to be a new center on this roster before the draft. Will it be a starter caliber type? I don't think so. Given the strength of the draft class at center, I think Pittsburgh's been itching to find that true long-term replacement for Marquise Pouncey that they've not been able to do, to do. They, totally misevaluated, had a bad process on Kendrick Green, and then signed Cole to be that bridge and you know short-term replacement. Cole, I thought, was solid in 2022. And I don't know if that was maybe partially when you compared him to Kendrick Green, just to see competent center play kind of maybe made Cole look a little bit better. But I think still overall... Uh, you know, Cole was good in 2022 and then a big drop off in 2023 snapping was an issue. Obviously pass protection was terrible. Run blocking got a bit better as the year went along, but it was still never really all that good. So I'm just, just with that, what, what do you think happened to Cole in 23 that caused such a, a big drop off in his game? Well, first and foremost, I, I, I would not characterize his play myself in 2022 as solid. Now, was he the Ritz cracker <laughs> 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 compared uh, to what we had seen out of, out of Kendrick green? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I thought, you know, my takeaway from Mason Cole in 2022 was the fact that, uh, he gave you what you needed to be able to function on that line, at least to be able to run the football and win some games. He was not someone I think that you pointed to and, and, and went, well, if only Mason Cole had, had done this or done this throughout the season, uh, you know, pass protection as a whole or, 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 or the run game as a whole would have been better. I thought he was an, an, an he did an adequate job. I just think that adequate uh, went, deteriorated in 2023 uh uh just you know the the, the strength component uh the 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 athleticism uh component uh just everything that you would want out of a center especially if you're going to do you know uh uh heavy zone stuff and want to get 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 your guy off the first block and into the next level that's that, that he's no longer that guy uh in pass protection he became even more of a liability in my opinion in 2023 and for what he was making or scheduled to make uh in in in, in 2024 uh when when, when combined with the fact that you're probably going to get younger and, and try to go for a more future, uh, long-term future type, type of prospect as well, too, the, the, the you know, play, you know, all the, all the, all the, uh, cross sections on the, on the axis there weren't lining up there. So mm -hmm. once again, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't expect him to, to, to really be on the roster come week one of the season. I did kind of wonder if he would make it past at least his roster bonus date for the sheer fact that, you know, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't put this team in, 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 you know, one of those necessary holes, if you will. But on the flip side, you can understand why he is out the door this mm -hmm. early as well. And then on top of it, I mean, you've got a couple of weeks coming up. You, you don't know what's going to even happen with some of these other veteran, maybe centers around the league that might end up being casualties as well, too. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that deep of a hole or it's not that, that side, that, that kind of hole that, that makes it hard to fill, you know, uh, but, but before the draft. Sure. And, and again, I think they will add a, a low tier type of free agent to have something there and then go into the draft, 
know, targeting a center, I think within the, the top two picks, first two rounds, they're going to, they're going to come away with somebody. And we'll talk about those names uh, in, in a moment. I, I do want to give Cole credit. I thought he was tough and durable and a good leader for a young offense overall, but the, you know, on field play is, is the most important thing post snap. And that was too often just a, a disaster this past year. And under Pat Meyer, the center has more responsibility in pass pro. I think under other O-line coaches, other systems, the guards help the center more. The center's not, you know, solo 1v1 in pass protection as often. In Pittsburgh, you know, if that guard's uncovered, he helps a tackle to, to help him on the defensive end. And the center is left 1v1. And that puts more pressure on your center, really has to have great anchor and be a strong pass protector. And Cole was not anything but in 2023. So that's the book closed on him. And then again, looking towards the future, we'll talk about some more free agent options probably within a week or so. And then the draft, it's a good center class. Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, West Virginia, Zach Frazier, the top two names we'll discuss. I don't want to, I'm always careful because I've been guilty of this in the past to not put on blinders and only focus on those two names. There are other center candidates, whether that's Graham Barton from Duke, Uh, I'll I'll have a report uh, Tuesday on Matt Lee from Miami, Florida. I think he's a sleeper prospect in this class. But I think, again, you're going to hear Powers Johnson and Frazier dominate the conversation when it comes to Pittsburgh looking to draft their next center. They need a pedigree guy. They need somebody that they can throw in there for at least the next seven or eight years. You know, obviously this, uh, the Steelers organization as a whole has a, has a great history when it comes to franchise centers. And, uh, you've got to have one of those in, 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 in today's NFL, uh, especially if you're going to run a lot of zone stuff and, 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 you know, get, get, you know, attack the center of the line and, and expect these centers to get out in space and off those first blocks and things of that nature. So uh, it, 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 it's time. And I would at this point, I mean, it, w- it wasn't a secret heading into uh, the end of last week when it, you know, when it came to what this team might do in a draft specifically at the center. But now, I mean, now that Cole is officially out the door, uh, it, it would be quite shocking if if one of the first two selections that this team makes in the 2024 draft is not a center, quite honestly. No, I agree. Do you have any inclination just as of right now? I know it's still relatively early in our process and the combine's coming up. And of course, the Blues Clues for Pro Days will tell us hopefully a lot, but who they might be leaning towards if you had to pick just one name in terms of a center prospect that they're going to draft, which way you, would you lean? Uh, I mean, obviously, I think it's going to be one of the top two, Jackson Powers Johnson or, or, or Zach Frazier, uh, personally. I, I think those are your two best uh, candidates there uh, overall. And I think you know, what happens with the rest of the blue Blues Clues process. Here's the thing, and, and we talk about it almost every uh, every pre-draft process here. Center, for the most part, tends to get pushed down. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, overall, well, interior uh, guards and centers uh, seem to get pushed down, uh, which, you know, unless there's another team in a situation like the Steelers that, you know, really, really have a huge, huge hole that picks in the first 19 picks of, of, of saying they need that new franchise center. Uh, I, it, it, at least from where I sit right now and kind of looking at, uh, you know, the top guys at other positions and, and, you know, a top 25 to top, you know, 40 board overall, I tend to think that they might get their, their, their uh, choice of one of those two whichever you know whichever top center they deem to be the top center of the class it sort of feels like they'll have the choice of so you think at 20 you know if it's Frazier and Powers Johnson are on the board is that kind of where you might be leaning in terms of where they're going to go with absolutely 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 I mean once again why not get the guy you know okay uh uh, you know, some people say, okay, uh, you know, one of the two or both of the two might be second round guys, you know, by, by the time the smoke clears. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if that's your guy, you go get them. You know, if, 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 if you deem that that can be your franchise center, you know, for the next 10 years and, you know, he checks all the boxes, then, then definitely go get them. Sure. That makes sense. It's going to be the front runners probably for that that pick there at 20 others will be in the mix of tackle and maybe corner. But I think I, if I had to pick one name and those are candidates, I think all the names we mentioned, even Cedric Van Prant Granger from Georgia, potentially a day two, third round, maybe fourth round kind of guy. He'll be in the conversation as well. I would lean towards them taking Frazier though. I think he's, I think they're just going to love his, his makeup, his mentality, his experience, his toughness. 
I think he just is a Pittsburgh Steeler. Sure. Uh, you know, I guess the only question is at that point, you know, if, if you deem him to be uh, the, uh, the, the, the better option of the two is, you know, can you risk, you know, getting him in the second round? You know, where, where is his overall draft stock? And, and once again, if, if you deem him to be your guy, then go get him at 20, you know? Sure. Why, yeah. why, why, why mess around, especially if there's a drop off uh, at the center position after the top two? And I think arguably that there is, or is a kind of a tier one and then tier two with Powers Johnson and Frazier being in that tier one. So yeah, in terms of where that he'll go, I've always kind of felt day two, you know, second round is where Frazier is more likely to go. But as you said, if he's your guy, he's your guy. But you know, we'll, we'll be talking about those names in the center position thoroughly the next you know, two months. Well, you remember what happened last time this, this team got in a situation where we thought they could go center and, uh, you know, and, and potentially wait a little bit, you know, that you ended up with Kendrick Green, who, uh, you know, at the time, I, you know, I remember I didn't really even have him in the conversation uh, of, 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 of being center because he had played, you know, predominantly guard uh, at, at Illinois. And on top of that, he was undersized and all like that. I mean, the whole process was bad there. Uh, you know, you, 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 you circle back, you know, don't, uh, don't long story short, if, 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 if one of those two guys are your guys. Don't mess around and, and wonder uh, if one of those two top centers is going to fall to you in the second round. Mm -hmm. No, totally understand. And I think I, I'm not going to relitigate the whole Kendrick Green bad process, but take a true center, take somebody experienced, don't take a guard conversion right. type. It's played a bit of center. They need somebody who's likely going to start right away. And and I, I don't think they're going to go down this road again. It's, it's a partially new regime with Omar Khan. But yeah, they need a true experience center in this draft offers those type of people. Right. Absolutely. All right. The other news here that came out on Friday from an O-line standpoint. And well, this well, one, real, real oh, quick, yeah. let's let's cover the minutiae related to this. You oh, know, ba okay. based on the current rule of 51 and 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 the uh, roster displacement when it came to Mason Cole and what he was due uh, salary wise, you know, there's there's. You know, people will say, well, you know, what, what he scheduled to earn this and then, then, then the roster bonus and all like that. So did they save, you know, uh, over $4 million in cap space? Well, look, you, the rule of 51 is going to be, is what you work off of, especially come to the start of the new league year. So that's the way you have to treat anytime there is a player that is removed from the top 51 uh, you have to replace him uh, with someone in the rule of 51. That, that's the only way that you get true cap savings. Now, you can qualify it and say, well, they save X amount of money pending roster displacement. But if you if you consistently do that, you're not telling the whole story here. So based on the current rule, rule of 51 at the time, the Steelers cleared three point nine five five million in 2024 uh, salary cap space after roster displacement in the rule 51 took place. So, you know, make sure, you know, make sure that that it's always framed properly because I even seen some pages say, you know, try to say that they saved what his entire uh, cap charge was supposed to be, which was like six point. I don't know. What was it prior to with, 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 uh, with, uh, uh, other bonus price. It was like 6.6 .6 or seven or something like that. That couldn't be, you know, uh, further from the truth when it comes to that. So they saved a little under $4 million total in cap space, but the real kicker within all of this, when it comes to basic call, look, he would have survived, uh, he would have survived, uh, longer and would have survived into the start of the new league year had he not had that $1.5 million roster bonus due, right? I mean, Correct. Uh, because you have a trigger involved in there and may maybe what took so long with going from, uh, you know, several weeks ago or a couple weeks ago, you know, out the door goes Mitch Trubisky and Chiquama Corfor and all like that. And you kind of wonder about the timing at the time there. Maybe they, uh, maybe they went to Mason Cole and his agent and said, look, you know, if, if you if you want to hang around, you know, we're going to have to have you uh, relinquish that uh, that that that, you know, push that roster bonus due date back uh, overall and then then go from there. If you're willing to do that, then you can uh, then we'll we'll carry on the roster, uh, you know, throughout the summer and all like that. And, and maybe that's the way that they went on that. And but you know, once you had that trigger in there, the one point five million dollar roster bonus uh, come come you know, a few days after the start of the new league year. 
you know, once you pay that, it's gone and you have to account for that. So uh, that's what ended up a getting, you know, and Mason Cole might look at it as, hey, I'm free. You know, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, I get to beat the market out there as well, too. And, you know, maybe I can find me a team that's going to pay me three or four million dollars this year. Uh, He obviously wasn't worth that to 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 the Steelers here, but uh, he would have survived. Uh, this part of the offseason had he not had the roster $1.5 million uh, roster bonus in place. But uh, once again, the overall cap savings here, when you look at Mason Cole, is a little under $4 million when you do the roll of 51 roster in place. This place. Yeah, good information, good clarification there. So we'll, the move will still hopefully becomes official. Did it, did it get reflected on the Friday transaction log? Do you know, Dave? Um, Let's see. I had not seen it yet. Uh, Of course, I did not pull it up and on the road. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Okay, because or or will this become Chukwuma core forward takes a week to actually officially process the move, which we still don't know why that was. But it did happen while you were gone that a core force officially released by the Steelers. Yeah, I don't know why that was other than maybe just trying to wait a couple of days to see if you get some trade inquiries or whatnot. Uh, now, obviously, you can't officially trade a guy until the start of the the the, the new league year, but you can you know kind of have a trade you know basically agreed to and pending. Yeah, Mason Cole has officially been okay. uh, terminated as of uh, the twenty third. Okay, so that is officially official on <laughs> Mason Cole, and bless you. All right, uh, some more offensive line news here that occurred on Friday. Much quieter. The team actually never had an official release or announcement about it, but it did appear on the transactions log. And so Dylan Cook, exclusive rights for Asian, signed a one-year deal. No surprise he was going to return. Exclusive rights guy really did not have any opportunity to go away unless Pittsburgh did not uh, decide to tender him or sign him, which they did. Cook was signed last May by Pittsburgh, really impressed in training camp at Camp Darling, made the 53, didn't play all year, hardly dressed, but a developmental tackle that played some guard last summer to a really interesting name to watch in 2024. Yeah, not a surprise there. I mean, obviously, exclusive rights free agent. He didn't have uh, he didn't, he didn't have a choice but to sign it. Uh, uh, when it comes comes to uh, that, and it's it, it's a one year minimal salary uh, for exclusive rights free agents that he that he absolutely had to accept. Uh, those things don't get printed. I don't believe uh, as official transactions uh, uh, with exclusive rights, free agents, basically signing tenders or really, I think any, 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 any restricted free agent, uh, along with that doesn't get picked up by the NFL transaction sheet. So you kind of at the mercy of somebody, either a team putting, putting it in their transactions or an agent coming across that he's now under contract, uh, along those lines there. So that, 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 you know, the, the actual act of Dylan cook, uh, being back under contract is not surprising. There's one other uh, guy that we're watching at this point, I believe, that I hope to have some clarity on uh, by this afternoon, and that's Jeremiah Moon, the outside linebacker who the Steelers claimed off waivers uh, from the Ravens that we've talked uh, quite a bit about. Uh, if memory serves me, he was he was also scheduled to be exclusive rights free agent uh, this offseason. I'm trying to... S- get some clarification uh, from Joel Corey to see if indeed uh, Jeremiah, I would imagine if Dylan Cook has signed his exclusive rights free agent tender at this point that uh, Jeremiah Moon has all passed his physical and, and that kind of stuff and, 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 and probably done the same. So it's just a map. It, it's just a matter of, of process and that process getting officially done. So we'll see. And I believe those were the, were the only two that were scheduled to be exclusive rights free agents this offseason. Yes, I think so. And the salary on that is nine hundred and fifteen thousand. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so on Moon as well. Yes. Okay. And so, from a cap space standpoint, that eats up very little cap space, I guess, because once you do the displacement of of, of that, can you give some clarification there? Uh, yeah, I already have uh, Dylan Cook now in the uh, rule of fifty one. Uh, I'm waiting to find out, you know, officially what. What 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 the status is on on Jeremiah Moon? But uh, if indeed he did enter uh, the rule of fifty one, the displacement with him would be 
whatever 915,000 minus 795,000 would mm-hmm. be. So what what's that uh, 100 something thousand? 100 Right, right, roughly. But uh but if you just want to look at the Steelers uh not counting Jeremiah Moon, but uh and 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 looking at this at a, at, at a what what the real situation did you guys cover what the uh, new salary cap number is no i want to do that right now actually because okay. you know, that came out when josh and i recorded on thursday night and then friday all the salary cap information came out so let, let's just dive into that right now because yeah that is that is one heck of an easter egg the mm-hmm. cap going way up uh, I, I know the number you were working off of the number that was kind of conventionally projected by teams and by agents was 242 and a half million and the actual salary caps coming in well above that at $255.4 million, a $30 million increase over last year. Uh, I think some of this was the deferred you know, payments from COVID and that whole salary cap contraction year. They're kind of getting that money back now. It seems to be the, the catalyst for why this number is so much higher than expected. So this is a it, it affects all teams equally. So in some sense, there's an even playing field element, but it's still a big boost for teams. Yeah, boy, you want to talk about uh, having to look at that number a couple of times when it came across <laughs> while I was out on the road there. Uh, uh, quite substantial, and it's it's rare. <clears throat> it's rare for guys, especially like Joel Corey, uh, former agent who who really has a great grasp year to year on on estimated. Uh, amounts for what the upcoming salary cap will be. And normally if there are misses there, I don't know, two or 3 million off uh, along those lines there, boy, this thing for this thing to come in uh, as, as high as it did, we essentially what 13 million more than the 242.5 million uh, that was floating around as an estimation that shows you what a machine uh, the NFL uh, uh, is and, and and the ability to bounce back from all the COVID and the and the borrowing from future years. Obviously, the new uh, television television contracts uh, 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 and 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 you know the things with YouTube TV and Amazon and Peacock and all those kind of things. And I'm, I'm guessing uh, uh, Taylor Taylor Swift's interest in the NFL did not hurt <laughs> things uh, to some degree out there as well uh, either. But boy, you, I mean, you want to talk a massive uh, uh, increase overall uh, when you look at the jump from last year to this year, roughly what, what, around $30 million. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's no small uh, increase overall there. So uh, what does this mean in the grand scheme of things? A, it shows uh, super great stability uh, by the league at this point, especially coming out of the COVID years. Uh, we, we say it all the time. It's a machine. I mean, they, they have this calendar set up the NFL calendar where you just, you go from one thing to the other. They have shows about everything. They keep the fan fans interest throughout the year. Uh, and I would imagine merchandise follows and, you know, the, 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 the sellability of the league, uh, all that involved. So the, the league is very, very healthy. Uh, what does this also mean? This means that teams now will have to spend more money. Uh, you're looking at a first year of a new three-year CBA uh, cycle here. And within that, the CBA says that teams must spend at least 90% of the total cap numbers added up over three years in cash overall. So if you're looking at the first year, you know, going uh, all the way up to what? What, what do we say? Two fifty. Two fifty five point four. Yeah, two fifty five point four. You got to think that most teams are going to uh, be in that ninety to a hundred percent range as far as cash spending goes. Uh, the players obviously benefit from that, uh, especially free agents and and players getting new contracts along the line there. So that, that, that's the big byproduct of this. Now, how does this uh, specifically impact uh, the Steelers? Well, I don't think you can look at it as it only impacting the Steelers because all teams are playing on the same uh, playing field there. So, you know, if it, if, if it, if it's, if it's more cap space to work with for the Steelers, well, it's more cap space for, for other teams to uh, work with as well too. Now I will say this, 
uh, as of right now, based on the $255.4 million league-wide salary cap number and based on the rollover this team uh, has from 2023, which is a little over $2.34 million, uh, and factoring in the Mason Cole termination and the uh, Dylan Cook uh, signing of his uh, exclusive rights free agent contract, I have this team just a hair over $9 million dollars in salary cap space in real time. To be exact, $9.005845 million in salary cap space. Now, that's in real time. Uh, that obviously does not take into account things that will happen later in the offseason that I always like to lay out, things like the you know mandatory uh, workout bonus placeholder, which is less than a million. You got the rookie pool offset for this team, which is almost $4 million. You got the end of the rule of 51 for the 52nd and 53rd player, which is almost $1.6 million in estimation. Practice squad is going to eat up for another $4 million. Injured reserve. Yeah, any guys on injured reserve space that eats up maybe additional sp space, it's good to budget about $2 million for that. And then in-season injury replacement going off of kind of what this team went into the uh, last season with in, in, in available uh, cap space. Uh, going to use that number as $6 million, uh, this year. Uh, if you add all that together along with the fact that this team is in real time $9 million, a little over $9 million under the cap, you technically can look ahead and say that this team need, needs to clear at least another $9.4 million in salary cap space just to before you know before you work on anything there now once again there's lines in the sand when this happens don't worry about uh you know the additional nine you know the additional uh what 18 something million dollars that 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 this team has to account for because it'll all come out through the wash there but when you look short term specifically at the start of the new league year and how much this team will likely want to go into free agency with when it comes to available workable salary cap space to uh to work with that number is probably going to come in somewhere what do we say uh a couple weeks ago somewhere between 15 12. and 50, yeah, 12 to 12, probably anywhere between 12. And, and, and this was obviously before the new cap number mm -hmm. uh, was set. So yeah, I think you can widen it out a little bit and say anywhere between 15 and $20 million uh, in available salary cap space that the Steelers will probably uh, want to get to. Now, there's still an elephant in the room when it comes to Allen Robinson, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you have to wonder what's going to happen there with the $10 million salary that he's on the books for, uh, Patrick Peterson is another guy that we're kind of, uh, watching specifically because he's got a $3 million roster bonus due and who else was, uh, was on Larry that? Okunjobi. Yeah. So, yeah. Larry, bonus. I, and I think he comes back. Yeah, I do as well, too. I, and I think one of the main things when you looked at prior to uh, a guy like Mason Cole being cut. Mitch Trubisky and, and 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 a few of these others here, Larry Ogan, Joby kind of felt like the safest of the bunch just because uh, the lack of depth that the, that 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 the Steelers have uh, in the defensive line room overall there. But uh, uh, definitely they're going to have to look at guys like Allen Robinson, and they got plenty of time to do it because he does not have a roster bonus uh, due. But you'd probably want to get some of that settled by the start of the new. Uh, new league league year. I mean, but there is a chunk of money to save there. Uh, there will continue to be conversations about Cameron Hayward as we move through the off season. Uh, I think you are with me that you would uh, 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 doubt Cameron Hayward taking a pay cut, straight pay cut. I think Cam Hayward kind of went off again these <laughs> last couple of days. Uh, not happy with people suggesting that he take a pay cut. Uh, let it be known that uh, none of us at Steeders Depot have come out and said uh, that he should take a pay cut. The only thing that we anticipate happening, at least I don't think none of you have done, done uh, uh, have, have suggested Cam Hayward take a pay cut. But, uh, you know, the thing that we do that, that I could see happening is he get something like a two year extension with no new money up front that that uh, really the process ends up lowering his cap number and he still gets paid that 16 million dollars that uh, he's scheduled to earn uh, this season here. So uh, night, you know, prior prior to 
the the uh, the league setting the new cap number at two fifty five point four million. Uh, it, this team looked like they had a little bit of meat left on that bone uh, to trim off of to 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 at least get cap compliant. Well, you know, the, the cap number coming in an additional thirteen million dollars more than what we thought it would be instantly puts them under the cap and even more so with the termination of Mason Cole. So they're look, they're in great shape overall. The, the, the question now becomes how how much space do they want to how much spendable cap space do they want to go into free agency with a couple of weeks from now? And I think realistically you can see that number once again somewhere between 15 in 20 million overall. So uh, there is another element uh, to all this as well, too. And it goes back to the 90% rule. Pull out your calculator, please. Pull out your, yeah, you were under the impression there would be no math today. Uh, <laughs> Days I'm, back, there is math. Yeah, I'm going to give you a pop quiz here uh, today, Alex. So pull out your calculator here uh, and figure out for me what is 90% of 255.4 million. Let me take off my shoes here. It's going to be 229.86. All right. Let's round up to 230 million. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, what, what, what is that number and why is it significant? I kind of, this is the first year of the new three year period of the CBA. As I mentioned, I would fully expect the Steelers, uh, to spend at least 90% of this year's cap number in cash. All right, what qualifies as cash? Uh, this year's uh, a player's base salary that's due to him this year. Uh, maybe a roster bonus that's due to him uh, this year. That counts as cash. Uh, those are the two main variables when it comes to cash expenditures uh, with a player. A signing bonus. Anybody giving a, given a signing bonus this offseason, albeit through a new contract, or a contract restructure, or uh, let's see, what else? An uh, extension, I yeah, guess. Yeah, an extension, right, an extension. Uh, that total amount of the signing bonus given to the player uh, counts as cash in that given year as well, too. So if you were to give a guy, let's say, an $18 million signing bonus this year, well, all, even though for cap accounting purposes, that gets spread out over the uh, – uh, you know, however many years of the contract that you're doing this for, uh, the actual payment of the signing bonus, assuming that it 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 it, it, it you know is given in a current year. Now the the payment form, the payment structure of that might be in an agreement different, but as far as hard uh, cash accounting, it would go into in, into this year. So, in long story short, if you look at this team uh, right now, from let's say a cash expenditure uh, 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 process of their top roll of 51 right now you're looking at this team right around let's say 180 million in cash uh, on the books right now and you just threw out what 230 million as, so as a 50 as, million in cash is what you're uh, anticipating right I, I and this is rough and this is uh you know uh uh what are they saying that Sp SpongeBob beam meme? Write this down. Uh, <laughs> write, right. write that down. But I, I would envision another fifty to sixty million. I think in cash being spent by the Steelers moving forward from where they sit right now in the rule of 51. Now, obviously your, uh, your draft picks are going to mm -hmm. have signing bonuses, uh, th that account for cash. So, you know, let's, let's call that at 4 million, uh, accounted for, you know, 4 million going towards that right now. Uh, you could potentially see, uh, Alex Highsmith, although Alex Highsmith, e even if they do a restructure with him, uh, what you're likely to, I mean, you've already, that, that money just gets moved around. It's just paid out differently. So it's not like there's a, a, a huge shift in cash because he's already due 10.733 million in, in a base salary. It's just how, you know, that part of that's going to be given as a signing bonus. In other words, it's already on the book. So it's not like that number is going to jump there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're obviously, the where is this where's the bulk of this 50 to 60 million in additional cash uh 
likely to come from at this point. Uh, uh, an extension maybe for a guy like Pat Firemuth is a good place to start, right? Right. All right. Um, Your fifth-year option on Najee or well, whatever no, they decide no, to do with him or no? no oh, that'd no. be another big 2025. Right? Yeah, that, that's that's 2025 uh, cash that 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 that, yeah. that that you'd be dealing with at that point there. Now, obviously, you could do nothing that says that you can't do an extension with him now, you know, this offseason if they go that route. And then mm. obviously that would be a, 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 a cash extension uh, or, or a cash expenditure in 2024 if you did that. Uh you know, who, who, who else on this roster, you know, could potentially be a candidate, uh, to, uh, to, to have an extension. There's not many, I mean, really it's Pat Fryermuth and, 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 and who else, as far as a true, uh, extension goes. Now, obviously we talked about Cameron Hayward, but if there's no new money given to Cam Hayward, uh, as part of an extension done with him, that doesn't, that does, it, it's not like you're increasing the cash expenditure. You're just moving around the sixteen million dollars that he was already scheduled to make. You just mm-hmm. pay it, paying it out to him. You know, uh, uh, part of that in a signing bonus there. Uh, Deontay potentially. I think it's less likely to occur, but this summer that conversation will I think will at least get broached in the media. Yeah, I think people will be talking about it. I'll, <laughs> I'll be surprised if it happens, but uh, it's not going to stop people from talking about it. But then, uh, then the rest of it, I think, becomes down to uh, free agency, right? So mm-hmm. uh, obviously, the bulk of any off-season free agent signing, uh, when you're talking about cash, would come in the form of a signing bonus, right? So uh, those are things to look forward, lo- look at moving forward uh, here now. Uh, we're basing all this off of 90% of the cap. Now this team could, could decide, you know, when laying out their plan, we'll, we'll make up most of it in the second and third year uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, of this three year cycle. And in fact, I think if you go back to the last three year cycle, the Steelers were, 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 were way lighter uh, than 90% cash expenditure in the first of the three years uh, of the three years that just 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 finished there, but if they are to spend ninety percent of this year's two hundred fifty five point four million dollars in cash, just rough estimate, you know, from where they are right now, tells you that there will be you know probably somewhere between fifty and sixty million more in cash being spent this year. And once again, you know, Pat Farmer is probably going to take up a you know, pretty decent chunk of that. Uh, your, your draft picks are going to spend, you know, take, take up a little bit of that. And then predominantly the rest of it is going to come in free agency, but you know, a, a $12 million signing bonus for a guy. If you did that a couple of times for some mid tier free agents that can eat into that 50 million real quick. Right. Right. But it's really going to be a lot of, outside free agents because of your own free agents there isn't many there aren't many people that will command a lot of money in terms of a signing bonus mason rudolph is the top name to watch and we're still curious to see what his market's going to be what his value is going to be across the nfl but really other than him i mean there are some guys you can resign and give some small signing bonuses too for sure and and you know in total combined three four signings can can add, add up a little bit but there really aren't any marquee you know, pending for agents for Pittsburgh to, to address. Yeah, you're, you are correct, sir. Uh, Mason Rudolph, probably going to be the guy that, 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 that's watched the most, uh, or really any backup quarterback. Now, look, uh, I, I know with, with, with this looking like a windfall of, of 13 something million dollars of that extra cap space, uh, that sure seems like a lot of room to sign all these quarterbacks. The Steelers are going to sign Kirk <laughs> cousins, uh, boy, did the list grow any while I was away? I mean, this, this is going to be a hell of a damn quarterback battle that this, uh, that the Steelers have with Kirk cousins coming in, Russell Wilson coming in, Justin Fields coming in, Ryan Tannehill coming in, Mason Rudolph returning to the Steelers. <laughs> uh, who else am I missing there? That, that, that that's coming to Pittsburgh. Jimmy Garoppolo, Trey oh, Jimmy Lance. Garoppolo, Trey Lance, man. Yeah. Uh, even, even with this windfall of cap space, Alex, I don't think they're going to be able to afford all those guys. I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to go out on a limb there. Okay. Uh, sure. but, uh, uh, I, I think the ones to watch here that, that, that are obviously more realistic are, 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 are the Mason Rudolphs and the, uh, Ryan Tannehill's, but even so what kind of total cash expenditure are you looking at in 2024 when it comes to, uh, e- e- either one or even both of those guys? 
Let me ask you this, Dave. Given all the information you just laid out, your projections, your expectations, knowing now solidly what the cap number is for 2024, are your expectations for the moves Pittsburgh will make prior to free agency and then during free agency, whether that's Cam Hayward, Robinson, how they'll spend in free agency, et cetera, has any of that changed since knowing the cap number? I think you could see them be slightly more uh, active uh, overall. In other words, you know, maybe a, a, a another mid-tier guy or two over what I additionally uh, thought this would look at. But once again, I think, didn't we lay this out before, before I uh, went out of town talking about the hierarchy of the average yearly value when it comes to this team? Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, how, 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 how they would uh, likely address that. Once again, you got, if you look at the, at the overall hierarchy of this team of the top five salaries, you got TJ Watt at, 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 at 28 million. Uh, you got Deontay Johnson at, uh, uh, eighteen point three five five million. You got Mika Fitzpatrick at eighteen point two four seven million APY. Alex Highsmith at seventeen, and then Cam Hayward at sixteen point four. And then the drop off after that uh, is uh, is Larry Ogan Joby down at nine point five eight three million dollars. So I think the that 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 gap of of the the higher quality free agent that the Steelers would be likely to spend APY on would be somewhere between 10 and 16 million. Now, when you look at the cash needed to, to get those kind of deals done and, 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 and the signing bonuses and those kind of things there, I mean, you could, you could realistically see, I don't know, three guys enter, enter that space of between 10 and $16 million. Whereas maybe before I would have said maybe two, you know, mm-hmm. so uh, I still don't think people are going to be throwing a parade after free agency. But once again, I don't think it's going to I, I think it's going to be kind of on 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 par uh, on, on course of, of, of what you've kind of seen in the past, you know, probably three or four, you know, don't don't expect an 18 million dollar corner cornerback to come in here. First and foremost, that 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 would be my initial thought. So one of these top corners out there, I, I wouldn't expect. Or could you get someone in that, you know, uh, thirteen million range if if available? Yeah, that 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 fits in there. But I would not expect that any one position, and it, it would be really, uh, uh, you know, not 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 par for the course. I mean, or it would go against what this team has done in the past anyway, for them to be the top bidder for a top tackle or a top defensive tackle or something along those lines. But could, could you, could you compete in kind of that mid level market uh, when it comes to some of these free agents in that 10 to $16 million range? Yes. However, comma, if they're not high end, uh, 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 top of the market guys. Once again, will the Steelers come off of wanting to pay these guys more than just the signing bonus as far as guaranteed money goes? So that will be something mm-hmm. they're going to lose out on some of these guys if they're not willing to guarantee more than just the you know the 2024 base salary and the signing bonus. If that makes sense. It does. And my question was going to be, you know, to the idea of don't expect an $18 million corner. The question that I was going to have, not that I necessarily disagree, but just to, to ask it anyway, is why not? Why what's preventing them from doing that if they have the need, which they do. And if they have the money, which it sounds like they they would have, it seems like the structure of the contract may be the sticking point for Pittsburgh. Uh, well, a the structure would be the big would would be one of the main sticking points, especially when you're dealing with a guy probably a, a corner top of the market. Uh, he's going to want probably the first couple of years guaranteed, right? Right. At least the first two. Right. Uh, secondary is this team really respects once again, their own hierarchy uh, of, 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 of players under contract. And, and they're, they're not big fans of, of disrupting really kind of their top five earners when it comes to APY from the outside. What was Minka's APY? His is 18.247. Okay. Yeah. So if you could try to get somebody right under that, but yeah, I mean, uh, if you talk about where this team could add, I mean, I think I look at strong safety 
because it's not a good safety class in the draft. And I look at cornerback because there's a glaring hole outside corner opposite Joey Porter Jr. I think you take some big swings there and then go in the draft and focus on the offensive line and a strong center and strong tackle class. I would anticipate any quote unquote big, big swings that they have potentially maybe, like I said, as many as three uh, to fit somewhere between that 10 to $16 million APY. And then on top of that, assuming none of those players are top two, top three, uh, uh, highest paid at their position overall, which, which would be quite surprising, uh, that, that each one of those guys would be looking at, at the only guaranteed money being base salary and, 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 and signing bonus for gotcha. 2024. Now, now look, there's, there's, there's no rule that says you can't go out there and, and, and wedge in a, uh, uh, a top cornerback between Deontay Johnson and Minka Fitzpatrick. You know, one's at 18.35. Uh, there's nothing that says you can't get one to come in at $19 million and be the second, basically the second highest paid player on, on, on the Steelers roster behind TJ. Y. it's just from, from the mindset of what this, the way this team has operated franchise wise for a number of years, they don't, they don't generally mess with their top five APY guys, as far as hierarchy mm-hmm. goes, because of how it looks, you know? Yeah. And then the issue, I think even more so is the structure of the deal. They don't give out that second year and third year guarantee that corner is going to go take it from somebody else right. that puts Pittsburgh at a, for their own doing their own philosophy, a competitive disadvantage. But yeah, I think again, just broadly, and I'm talking in just very general terms here, for agency, focus on defense to draft, focus on offense. Of course, there'll be a mix of both, and you got to get a, a veteran quarterback in here of some sort. And for agency, and you're going to draft, you know, one, two, at least defensive players in this, this draft class, obviously. But that's just kind of the way that I'm looking at the lay of the land of, of how Pittsburgh may be allocating its money and how they're going to go into free agency in the draft. I think in free agency, corner, safety, D line, those are the areas you want to address. Yeah, look, I mean, you, you, you hit on it. Uh, as, especially when it comes to the ability to actually spend uh, notable free agency APY dollars. Corner, a strong safety, mm-hmm. and a defensive lineman, right? I mean, they're, they're okay at out. You know, they're not going to do anything with outside linebacker. Even if they did anything at inside linebacker, it's not going to be notable as far as APY goes, I wouldn't think. Uh, right. there. But I, I think that you hit on the three, posi- uh, on the three positions. We could be talking about three and a half weeks into the start of the new league year where they've, where they've spent some uh, notable APY and outside free agency uh, 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 contracts. I, you know, I, th- I think you hit on them. I think it's strong safety. I think it's corner and I think it's defensive line. And really if they don't hit on, on any of those three positions uh, you really have to think that they have to, make sure to spend early draft picks on those just because of the depth. They could really use another defense, you know, uh, 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 non nose, non nose tackle on that defensive line. Right. Oh, they need to. They, they right. I think it's so hard to find those guys in the draft to find the right body type and pedigree and obviously skill set and actual on tape performance. And that's why I advocate for D line. I don't have a name in mind yet. I have to do some research on that. Once we get past the combine, I will go straight towards the, my free agency wish list and uh, potential guys Pittsburgh could be interested in, but but I look towards D line for that. I look towards safety and free agency because again, the draft class is really weak, especially for more strong safety types. And then at corner, it's a good cornerback class overall, but you can really get a, a talented, more experienced type on the outside that you can trust and plug in right away. And then, of course, in free agency, a quarterback as well. Again, Tannehill, Rudolph is kind of where I'm expecting it. Not going to be as big a contract as a potentially a cornerback, but um, that's something that I think certainly will be added offensively through free agency. Right. And, and any 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 money that they spend out in outside free agency on the offensive side of football uh, isn't likely to be notable APY value, overall value, right? I mean, because, yeah, they could bring in another uh, a wide receiver from the outside, but, I mean, are, are, they're not going to go hog wild when it comes to APY there, even if they wanted to go outside the best fullback uh, <laughs> uh, out there. You're not talking about a, a huge expenditure. You know, could, could maybe they look at the tackle position? Yeah, I guess, but, I mean, you got the supply and the demand thing when it comes to uh, free agency and, 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 and tackles, and usually those top guys 
uh, uh, go early in the process and go at inflated values there. So uh, if you did add, end up adding an experienced tackle uh, through free agency here uh, after the smoke clears, you're probably looking at you know, three or four million dollar APY, which obviously isn't notable in the grand scheme here. So, uh, backing this this all up here, uh, I I went in b- before the cap number was was kind of announced. I saw this team may- maybe making kind of two uh, notable uh, expenditures as far as APY goes uh, uh, of, 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 of of let's say more than nine and a half million uh, this off season. And now that it, it, it this number has come in thirteen million more than, than 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 what the projected was, I can see that number being three now. I'm with you. Let me ask you this: Who was the highest APY for Asian signing last year for Pittsburgh? Was it Samalu? He beat uh, Peterson, I believe. Yeah, Samalu, I believe, was eight million dollars APY, and Patrick Peterson was seven, and then Cole Holcomb was uh, six. Uh, and then Nate Herbig, I believe, was four. Elena Roberts, three and a half. And that was the bulk of it, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe so. So I think we can probably safely assume that they're going to, their their biggest free Asian signing this year will have an APY above that $8 million that, say, Malu had last year. Yeah, just from inflation, you know, and, 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 and all like that. Once again, I, I think you could see a couple break that. In other words, slot in ahead of Larry Ogan Joby. And Larry Ogan Joby's at 9.583. Uh, because he was an outsider, I don't think you you worry about up, up upsetting the hierarchy when it comes to him because he's like number six on the list, I think, overall there. So mm-hmm. somewhere between, once again, that 16 and let's say $10 million range, uh, you might see at least two guys fit that criteria this year. I think you will. Outside. I think you have a good chance to see two and then maybe a third that comes in a little bit behind that in that six to seven type range. And then maybe that's your quarterback. I don't know, but something like that is probably how I'm kind of sketching out free agency and how it'll look in Pittsburgh. Right. So uh, once again, I I don't think people are going to be wanting to throw any parades after all this, but uh, uh, I I also don't want to paint a picture that this team's just going to sit on their hands either. Yeah. I think Omar Khan will be, I think it'll be an active for agency. Maybe it won't have the number, the volume, because last year, but that was Khan's first full off season as GM hired May 2022. The off season's essentially almost over in a lot of respects. For agency's essentially done. The first waves of it are done. The draft is done. You don't get to really shape your roster much. So last year was a time where there was a lot of churn there. I could see. You know, you may not see the number, the amount of churn this year, although you could at the bottom because there are so many free agents in Pittsburgh that may just end up walking that kind of creates some, some spots or some opportunity. But um, maybe you won't see the the kind of upheaval last year, kind of felt like that you had, but you're going to see, I think, a couple of notable moves at the at the top of free agency. You know, this team, you know, l- 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 what's going to happen with Darnell? L- let's take Darnell Savage from the Packers for, for, for as an example here. What What's mm-hmm. going to happen with him this offseason? I had not followed his time in Green Bay much in terms of his outlook when it comes to free agency. I don't know what the odds of him being retained are or aren't. I believe Pittsburgh had interest in Savage Mm -hmm. coming out of the draft. So, again, I had not done a deep dive into a list of names, but that'll be one that will likely end up being on my list at some point and in some regard. Right. Uh, you know, and, 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 and I pulled him out because there was all that talk about him. You know, I, I believe the Steelers had a lot of interest in him. And and here's the other thing, like it or not, they, it, these are probably going to be guys that are easily any any free agents that they sign during the offseason are probably going to be guys that they've had some connection to uh, uh, way back during their pre-draft process. Right. That's typically how Pittsburgh operates this time of year. And Darnell Savage was one of those guys. I'm, I'm just throwing out names here because mm-hmm. we're, 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 we're kind of going uh, positionally there. And, uh, you know, who, who, who else as far as uh, uh, defensive lineman goes? I mean, have you have you looked at any of those whatsoever? I really have spent okay. little time doing that, but that once the combine wraps up after right. this upcoming week, I'll I'll jump on that pretty heavily. All right. Well, long story short, I, I think we've laid out, you know, kind of. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if you know what the total cash expenditure uh, is for this team in 2024. Uh, mainly after the uh, the draft smoke clears, because after that point, uh, you know you should be able to get in a spot then when you when you start reverse engineering the cash that has been spent by the team up until that point. 
what what an offseason extension from a cash st- standpoint would look like for for a guy with Pat Fryermuth. That that uh, be, be, because of those cheat systems allowed me to almost hit the Alex Highsmith number right on the nose uh, uh, last year because of kind of mm-hmm. uh, having an idea of, of what they were going to spend in, 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 in cash. But uh, it will be interesting, you know, let's say after the draft specifically uh, seeing where this team uh, ends up in cash expenditure relative uh, percentage relative to the overall cap number. And I, I have a feeling that, that we're probably not going to be too far off when, when projecting this team to spend, let's say another 50 to $60 million in cash uh, from, from here until the start of week one, the blues clues of the cap. And so good job day breaking it down and having that information on Friday and to be able to adjust and provide that to people was, I think really valuable when that news broke, because it was a surprise to see the cap go up that significantly and left a lot of fans wondering, okay, what does that mean for the Steelers? Hopefully you guys now know what that means for Pittsburgh. I have some breaking news for you, uh, Alex Kazora, uh, okay. uh, on a Monday. Jeremiah Moon has signed his exclusive rights free agent tender for 915000 for two, 2024. All right. So that is in the books. And so, again, that was a, 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 a well, kind of unusual, but more common than you think situation of him being claimed at playoffs and then. Um, you know, not being able to be, be made official until post Super Bowl, but then also the wrinkle of him technically being a free agent, albeit an exclusive rights one who was easy to retain, like Dylan Cook. So uh, he will be in camp. Moon will be in camp uh, in 2024, and we'll see how he looks. Yeah, it, look, none of this is shocking. It's just getting the finality of it uh, done. Is, uh, like we talked with Dylan Cook, you knew it was going to happen uh, with him. It's not something that 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 that. You know, uh, especially when it comes to exclusive rights, free agents, they don't make readily available that news. But uh, now we can confirm that uh, Jeremiah Moon, is, like Dylan Cook, is under contract for 2024. And Moon, a toolsy, you know, get off the bus, looks good type of linebacker, played some played mostly edge, a little bit off ball linebacker. But he's he's raw, has to develop his hand use, has to get stronger overall. But uh, he's kind of a traitsy type of guy that we'll see how he looks in training camp. And shout out, shout out to Joel Corey, our friend Joel Corey at CBS Sports uh, for that information he provided me just moments ago. Yep, always the best, Joel Corey. So thank you for that. Um, Just to kind of go back into some of the things that Josh and I talked about last week, and this kind of will combine salary cap versus past comments. Patrick Peterson, one of his last versions of his All Things Covered podcast with Brian McFadden, seemed to be less sure about his status and future standing with Pittsburgh, saying the balls in their court essentially. It, you know, they'll, they'll decide on my future. I want to come back. I want to play in 2024. Does the cap situation and the cap increase, does that change your calculation in terms of the odds Peterson returns or not? You know, where, where do you come in on that, knowing all that you know right now? I think that you can get yourself in trouble with deciding whether or not to keep a guy based on uh, cap increase percentages. I, I think that's the dangerous way to look at it. I think this rolls back to kind of the discussions that we had going into the off season when it comes to Patrick Peterson. And that is the fact if, of, is Patrick Peterson worth $6.85 million? Plain and simple. Mm-hmm. Is he worth that money? Now, uh, obviously, three. You know that that decision unfortunately needs to be made sooner rather than later. They might be going to him along the lines of Mason Cole. Say, hey, brother, you want to push that back, uh, that roster bonus back to to uh, to to week one of the season, and, and you know, and and on the flip side, Patrick Peters is probably saying, no, hell no, I don't. <laughs> uh, I want to know about my security. I want you guys to make a three million dollar uh, commitment uh, to me. But I I, I think. And here, here's the bad thing about this is you've got to make this decision weeks ahead of the draft taking place. And then, you know, obviously a couple of days into free agency uh, here. Now, the good part is, is if you found if you were able to find somebody else in the early stages of free agency, uh, you can sign that guy and turn around and dump Patrick Peterson before his roster bonuses do. That's that's kind of dirty pool, uh, so to speak. But uh, it's not I mean, this is a business, right? But uh, I think that it all boils down to is, you know, I, I think the only way that you should look at this when it comes to Patrick Peterson is 
is he worth six point eight five million dollars in two thousand twenty four? That that that's the question that you need to answer. That's fair, and that should be first and foremost beyond just what the cap increase is and, and those types of things. So I know we've had the, the the conversation before and kind of gone back and forth. Do you expect Patrick Peterson to have his roster bonus picked up, and will he be a Steeler come say April? I tell you, it's it's a rough one, and and and, and I, I keep going back through my head of is he worth six point eight five million dollars? You know, had had we seen anything more out of Darius Rush or Corey Trice? Uh, junior or, or, or really anybody else on this roster, uh, not name, you know, some of these free, free agents, uh, here, it'd probably be a little bit, uh, a little bit easier decision overall. Uh, the guy is a veteran. He did have an up and down 2023 season overall. I thought he played a little bit better as, as the season rolled along there. I don't think you want to get in a situation where you're pe- where you're playing him 75% or more of the snaps. Hopefully you don't get in a situation like that. But my gut at, at, at this point is I think he's worth $6.85 million for what he brings this team especially with the shape that the secondary is right now. Now, if you get two days in one day into free agency and you're able to up basically upgrade him uh, via free agency, then I think you let him walk out the door, you know, uh, or, or, or you tell him, are you sure that you can go get $6.85 million somewhere else? Because uh, uh, if not, you might might want to give us a little bit of that back and 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 in your in your career playing for a guy that you want to play for in Mike Tomlin. But from right now, where you look at this roster at cornerback specifically, and not knowing specifically what you what you're going to grab in the draft, even though it does look like it's a deep a deeper cornerback class overall, I tend to think he's worth six point eight five, and I. I I'm, I'm, I probably would not have said that three weeks into the 2023 season. Yeah, no, I think after the first month, yeah, certainly he was, he was a wreck, but I think his play picked up and, and my, my, my overall assumption and I, you know, Peterson's comments had me on edge a little bit, had me kind of second guessing myself, but I will ultimately say that Patrick Peterson is a stealer come April. They will pick up his, his roster bonus just when you consider you know, Levi Wallace is a free agent. James Pierre is a free agent. Jaden Sullivan's a free agent. Some of those guys may come back, but you're losing that. You got holes a strong safety outside corner. Um, I, do you want to add another in, in all those snaps that Peterson offered? Now, I don't think he can play outside cornerback anymore. I think he's a slot guy. I think he's a safety. He's going to maybe work in some more sub packages than your base defense and every down type of capacity. But with the leadership, the versatility, I think his play was you know better throughout the year. I think with more time to learn safety, he can he can improve there and improve his angles and be a better tackler. Trying to make that switch midseason is is extremely difficult to do. And I thought he generally held his own for being in those very difficult circumstances. So for all those reasons, I do think he will return. Look, this team just paid ten million dollars to Jaquan Marcor for just to just sit on the sideline, right? Um mm-hmm. uh, I could think of worse ways to spend six point eight five million dollars on a on a guy that's probably not going to cause you any problems and and help from a leadership standpoint and you know some snap standpoint obviously uh uh in in, in Patrick Peterson there so it, it he's right at that uh, I mean if if we're talking about eight eight and a half million uh, you know is is he worth that you know it's obviously it's obviously worth having the conversation I think. It, do you think he's? I, I don't think the cap increase plays into the, or shouldn't play into this whatsoever. I think it just comes down to is the man worth six point eight five million dollars? And from where I sit, and I look at the room right now, and I look at kind of where I think this team might go early in the draft, and I look at the you know the the younger guys, I think six point eight five million is, is acceptable to 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 keep him at. Yeah, I mean, if you were to you know go from Cam Sutton to Peterson, not having to replace all the Peterson offer with somebody new, who that guy is, you really have no idea. At some point, you're going to trip yourself up. Now they have to get younger and faster and find a you know future option. Peterson, if he does come back, 2024 will almost certainly be his last year in Pittsburgh, potentially his last year in the NFL. So you got to start having an eye towards the future. But I think you can do that this off season and then make that transition from Peterson to the next guy 
for 2025. It's probably a bad way to look at it, but if you did cut them, who are you going to replace them with? Yeah, that's kind of my point. I mean, you know, it, I hadn't looked at, at the list of names, like I said, but you know, it, it is hard to find that guy that's versatile and, and a veteran and a good leader and good teammate. And he does check those boxes. And, and I think his play, you know, listen, he was a mess the first month. I don't, I, I was critical. Uh, I was critical of the signing when it happened. I thought Sutton should have come back and that would have been a better use of money, you know, spending a couple million more on Sutton than what, what they spent on Patrick Peterson. But uh, I thought, you know, after the first month he settled in and and what he did late in the season was still, you know, pretty good. Look at my charting, look at some of the, the metrics that I had pulled up. He was much, much better after the first four weeks. So I think for all those reasons, he will return. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. And, and once again, it's probably not a great way to look at it. Well, if not him, then who? And obviously, even, you know, the, 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 this, this list of cornerbacks who were scheduled to become unrestricted free agents, there's bound to be four or five added to it. Uh, via via cuts and whatnot, but uh, uh, I just think if you look at, at at the total package of what Patrick Peterson gives you, based on the price, based on knowing, uh, no, you know, uh, uh, dealing dealing, you know, dealing with with the guy that you already know that's already in your system, there, uh, I, I I think you could do worse than uh, than than him for sure. But I think he is certainly the name to watch the next two and a half weeks or so in terms of, you know, what decision they get made on him. When Omar Khan speaks to the media Tuesday, I'm sure he'll be asked about Peterson. Very interested to hear what Omar Khan has to say on Patrick Peterson. And, you know, look, uh, even, even uh, didn't we talk a little bit about Nixon with the Packers and he's uh, uh, an unrestricted free agent. I mean, he is a guy that's probably going to get some attention in free agency, but probably not over the top. He could be an affordable guy, but even bringing him in, you know, let's say it, it you know, uh, let, let, let's say his APY was comparable to what, what Peterson's is now. Uh, do you, you know, you don't get a lot of tape that comes with him and you don't get all that experience and leadership that comes with him as well on top of, it. I mean, there's nothing to say that you still can't keep Peterson and, and, and go get a, 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 another middling, uh, APY, uh, free agent quarterback in, in, in a guy in, in, in case on Nixon. Sure, you could. Although I do think with Peterson, though, you need to have an idea. Okay, what is the plan for this guy? What do you see his role? I mean, yeah, he's kind of this catch-all, can wear a lot of hats, but you gotta you gotta define that and spell that out a bit more for his benefit and for the team's benefit. Is he gonna be the slot guy in sub packages in nickel? Is he gonna go become in in dime packages? Become kind of a, a, sure. a rover defender? I mean, he can do a lot of things, but you do have to probably lay out what you vision his role being. And I, I don't know if you go sign that more veteran slot corner, because I assume if Peterson does return, he will be spending a bulk of his time playing in the slot. And look, you've got to make that because of that roster bonus due date. You got to kind of come up with that formulated plan a couple of days into the start of the new league year. Right. My, again, just sketching things out kind of on the fly. What I think they'll do is they'll they'll pick up his bonus, retain Peterson. They'll re-sign Shannon Sullivan. He's a bit better as a, you know, if they want to be a nickel on first and 10 against 12 personnel team with good tight ends, Sullivan a bit better against the run, a little more aggressive downhill than Peterson. So they'll re-sign Sullivan super cheap to do that. Then I think they go draft somebody. So there's some good slot corners in this class, a Max Melton from Rutgers, the Michigan kid, for example. And that'll be kind of the, the bridge for next year. That guy will take over and kind of become your every down slot corner when Peterson departs uh, for the 2025 season. Alex, we are two weeks away from free agency, if you can believe that already. I know. It is crazy, man. It is going to, and the combine, like the combine's going to fly by. And so it's going to be here before we know it. What do you think, uh, kind of switching gear, you got anything left about uh, the cap and kind of free agency and starting new league gear and, and potential cap casual? I think we we hit on most of that. We even delivered a little bit of breaking news today as well, yeah. too. So. Yeah, no, that's all I, all I needed to, to say there, Dave. All right. Uh, what do you think about guys like uh, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr.? Uh, basically, I, I think the report is this morning that he's not going to do anything moving forward uh, uh, through the pre-draft process. Right. Not just sitting out the combine, but also no work at his pro day. And the report being that he's going to just train football things, not run 40s, not worry about his vertical, but actually just train as a wide receiver with the intent of whoever drafts him will get somebody training for actual football events, you know, the entire pre-draft process. Because, you know, 
when we watch these guys run the 40 at the combine, that's the last time they're going to run a 40. Right. Unless they're just messing around on the side, you know, off season type thing. You've seen steel players do that. But like after this three cone times and none of that matters, it becomes football drills and actual things that are applicable, you know, directly to the game. And so for Harrison, um, that's his approach. It sounds like, and you had the point of, you think this will be more common from, from top guys going forward. Yeah, and I think that could uh, there's going to be a trickle down effect from that as well too. And th- this is not anything new that you and I haven't talked about. We are big combine uh, number aggregators and have been for <laughs> several years. Uh, uh, one of the highlights for me, uh, uh, I mean, it's multifaceted. You know what I love about the combine because it, 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 I, I learn a lot of the side stories about these guys. Uh, going into it, uh, you know, from, from just the, the the mere people talking about them on on NFL Network and all like that, and then obviously the uh, uh, the athletic profiles that you're able to 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 build coming out of this. And we've talked about this before in the past, uh, especially since COVID and all. It seems like fewer and fewer of these players are 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 doing everything at the combine. At least everything. I, I don't care if they run a 60 yard shuttle. I mean, uh, to, to me, that's always been an, an, an outlier that, 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 that wasn't needed, but it sure is nice to get some triangle numbers on these guys and, and be able to, to, to get, you know, relatively full, uh, relative athletic scores on these guys or, or the old P spark numbers, uh, that it seems to be a thing of the past now. And I think we've, we've said in, 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 in past conversations that we've had, Alex is, are we going to get to the point moving forward of, of, of these kids doing less and less things at the combine, uh, overall, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, I understand why they do it because I mean, what, what, do you really want to mess up a hamstring or something uh, running a forty uh, mm-hmm. at, at the combine? Do you really want to mess up a, 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 a knee doing a short shuttle or something at the combine? I mean, the answer is no. When, when when all this is is just time stuff. Uh, do, overall, do I have a a issue with the with with these kids? opting out of these things, especially and, and the pro day on top of it. No, but the selfish part of me, you know, wants the advanced analytics uh, because I don't have access to all the things that, 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 that the teams compile throughout the college career and high school career. Of these, these guys at, 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 at my disposal here. So, yeah, I, I, and I would like, I'd like, I like to have full sheets so I can comparatively do this with these right. kids as well, too. So the selfish part of me, you know, takes issue with these guys not doing anything at their at, at the combine or 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 in, in the case of Harrison, probably not going to do anything at his at his pro day either. I understand it. I don't like it. It. If, if we had more selections of, of, of any game whatsoever that we wanted to pull off of all 22 tape, it would, it would help ease, ease the pain a little bit there. But, uh, I, 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 long story short, I think we're going to see more and more of this moving forward. And I kind of wonder at some point is the combine just going to be flat out a health component. And an and 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 an interview uh, a media interview process. Well, it's funny because that was sort of the original intent of the combine was for the right. medical evaluation and for the interview with the teams meeting players and getting to know the player personally. One thing that they really can't do during the season. Um, it's a it's a really interesting conversation. It's a layered conversation. I think in terms of the guys that will sit out entirely, like the Harrison types, there won't be many of those just because. Those are reserved for the top guys on the food chain, for the guys below that fighting for a spot and fighting to improve their draft stock. They may not do a lot of stuff at the combine, but they will at their pro day because it's still important to get those numbers to try to give them an edge and um, boost their stock in terms of the analytics and just compare to their peers and who they're competing against. You want to have better numbers than those guys. Uh, But I do think you'll probably continue to see fewer and fewer people do things at the combine because they can work at their pro day. It's a, it's a more known environment. The combine's a grueling process. They have tried to tweak things to make it less grueling, but you're got, you know, psychological testing, interviews, 
uh, medical testing, drug testing. I mean, you're, you're up all, all the entire day and then has to work out and that puts a lot of strain on these guys. So why risk having worse times and outcomes at the combine when you can just rest up, continue to train as well, and then work out at your pro day. So I think that trend will continue. I think you will see the top guys occasionally take the Harrison approach, but I think the majority will still be working out in some capacity in the pre jab process, because for most of those guys, they need that opportunity. Right. I don't think there's going to be a huge shift, you know, like, like, like this year, but I, I think you're going to slowly see, you know, it's already eaten away since, since combine and then moving, you know, we, we've mm-hmm. seen this since them moving the times around with, with, with the combine stuff as well, too. You know, the, these guys have such a long wait that they say, ah, the heck with the, uh, heck with the three cone and, and, and the heck with the short shuttle or whatnot, you know, I already did a broad jump. I, I, I just think as, as we continue to progress, this is something I've thrown out there with, with, with you at uh, this time of year, uh, almost annually for as long as we've done this. Now, I, I think you're going to continue to see a shift with, with, uh, getting less, getting fewer and fewer full, full, athletic profiles on these guys moving forward. Sure. I think that's true. I think that's the way this thing's been going. And I think that's the way this trend will continue. Here's the other trend too. And it's going to start this year. And I think it's a really important conversation for us to have is how will pro days look? I don't know if you saw the news, the big 12 was officially going to have a mini combine and hold their pro days all in one location at the end of March over a couple of days span. It's not going to be individual schools from the big 12 working out their individual pro days. And I, I, I'm guessing if this goes well, and I think it will be well received by, by teams and scouts and the NFL and probably colleges, it's, uh, generally speaking, you're going to see other conferences and college football do the same. And you're going to see the death of the individual school pro day workout five years from now. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it too, for our standpoint, because we, we, we don't I get to play it. our blues clues game anymore. I'm, uh, yeah. I much, I'd, I'd much rather see, Instead of Mike Tomlin going to the uh, ACC Pro Day, mm-hmm. uh, having Mike Tomlin show up at the Clemson Pro Day, you know. You want to uh, make him choose. You want to make him choose. Right, right. Uh, from a team perspective, I would understand you you get more coverage that way. and You, you obviously, you know, get to, would, would, I understand why they would do it. Uh I don't like it. It's, it's another thing from a, from a selfish reason why I don't like, because, you know, we, we've always kind of prided ourselves in trying to find who goes mm-hmm. where, you know, you know? Yeah. It, it's less information for us. I, I do think the one downside potentially for teams to do this is, will you get to know the people as, as much? Will you have the pro day dinners that you would have in the past? We know Mike Tomlin loves his pro day dinners and, and that may be harder to do at a centralized location with, the entire conference there and the entire NFL essentially there as well. And so that may be one downside to it, but I think overall the ability to send your entire staff there instead of having to pick and choose and send, sure. you know, scout to this place, positional coach, this place, your GM to this other place. Um, I, I think being able to, to do that all in one location, that'll be a winning message and solution for NFL teams. Yeah. Look, I mean, you'll be able to reach more kids and have more personal interaction with more kids by doing a, a, say a conference pro day like that. Right. So that's what the big 12 is doing. And I think it's going to be a good test run of what the, uh, you know, college football and draft community is going to, going to see how it goes. And I think it's going to go well. I think it'll be well received and I could easily see the rest of college football falling in line within a couple of seasons. What are uh, uh, Omar Khan will speak? Uh, and, and for those that don't know, we have uh, three people, really three and a half or four. If you, if you, if you count, uh, uh, one of our draft profiles in Ryan Roberts there, but, uh, we will have Joe Clark, uh, Ross McCorkle and Jonathan high uh, at the combine, uh, this year. And, and, and once again, Ryan Roberts, uh, will, will, will be there. So we kind of count him in that as well too. Uh, and Omar Khan will speak to the media, I think, uh, Tuesday at what, 10 30 and what, what are, what, what's one of the last year, one of the most pressing questions we hoped. Uh, and did ultimately get to ask uh, Omar Khan was, uh, you know, what, what the outlook was for DeMarvin Leal. Mm -hmm. And obviously that didn't go well for DeMarvin Leal in 2023. What would be one of the top questions, you know, uh, you would ask Omar Khan or hope our guys ask Omar Khan or somebody ask Omar Khan this year? 
Well, putting aside the obvious and getting his thoughts on the quarterback situation, which I know he'll be asked about repeatedly, as he should be, and again, I assume his comments will be generally in line with what Mike Tomlin, Art Rooney has had to say, but I still want to hear, you know, does he give any indication to having the door open to, to acquire a big name quarterback, or what's his take on Mason Rudolph and the odds of him resigning? But I think putting that aside, I want to hear about how he feels about the offensive tackle situation. Is Dan Moore considered your starter? Do you have a desire to move Broderick Jones to left tackle? Um, Are you set at tackle? Do you feel like you have to add there? I want to get his thoughts on tackle because I think we perceive it as a need. And and I've been at the forefront of saying, I think Jones should go to left tackle, needs to go to left tackle. But I don't know if the team feels quite the same way. Yeah, especially another thing we forgot to hit. I mean, it, it, this isn't really news. We knew it was coming. We just now have a uh, exact amount when it is Dan Moore uh, long had since uh, 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 qualified for the proven performance escalator in 2024. The only thing that we didn't know for sure is what would that amount be because all that's based off of uh, uh uh, tender amounts, which are obviously based on uh, the salary cap. So now you're in. This, uh, now that we know all this and, and, and know how much, uh, and once again, it, it, it's not like it's a significant difference either way there, but it is a difference. It's a little bit higher than what originally uh, 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 expected to be because the cap came in a little bit higher. When you look at Dan Moore Jr. right now, based on uh, the raise that he he'll receive this off season, uh, for the proven performance escalator, uh, his uh, uh, base salary plus the you know the, the extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars that goes into that uh, means he will get three point three six six million in 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 two thousand twenty four. Uh, by no means does that amount mean that he has to start, right? Mm-hmm. But in, on the flip side, there it's not like it's an insignificant amount of money uh, either. Uh, and, and long story short, this this could still go either way with him. But if you don't go out and draft, if you don't go out free agency and, and sign a, a, a top tier or a guy that you would deem a starter at tackle, which quite obvious, uh, how surprised would you be if the Steelers went out and signed a starting right or left tackle in free agency this offseason? From from where we sit right now, I would be pretty surprised. I would be as well too. Now it's not a it's not impossible as I like to say, but at least from where we sit right now, it would be at the very least you'd probably sign somebody at least to compete with Dan Moore, right? I mean, I, I think the draft is going to provide the value there if that's what you want to go. But I mean, if you what I'm saying is if you were to sign any free agent above oh. minimum a, as a tackle this off season, it would probably be somebody not automatically given the starters job that would compete with a guy like Dan Moore. Yeah. What I think you would do is go sign a veteran who can play the left and right side because you, who's your backup tackle right okay. now. Even if you assume for a second, Moore and Jones are your starters, you know, your, your backups, I think cook will be in that mix, you know, Spencer Anderson potentially, but you may want to have a more veteran experienced guy that has more time playing left and right tackle. All right. So, uh, you know, if you didn't, it, you know, let's assume they don't go out and spend the nine, 10, 12 million dollars on a starting tackle uh, 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 per year. Uh, you have to look at Dan Moore right now. And even if this team addressed the tackle position in the draft and addressed it early, look how long it took for them to get uh, Broderick Jones on the field last year. And would Broderick, how many, you know, uh, what, what path had brought, would Broderick Jones have taken? To the starting lineup, had Chikomo Kofor not mouth mouthed off. However, he mouthed off. It's a fair question. At that point, he was riding the bench, and so he may not have seen the field much, if at all. And yeah, yeah, I, I know people will sit there and say, "Oh, they have to replace Dan Moore," and and you know I can understand that standpoint. But he beat out Broderick Jones last year, or at least held him off, I should say. And then once he got hurt, as soon as he got healthy, he came right back in the lineup and sent Jones to the bench. And so they like Dan Moore more than most fans like Dan Moore. And so the, the, there's a there's a chance that it can be more in Jones as you're starting tackles again in 2024. Uh, yeah, that, that's us not beating around the bush right there. That's the long and short of it. A lot, uh, uh, and and it, you, know, you want to talk about indifference of pe- people say, well, you guys never, you know, you, all, you guys always want to talk about what you think will happen and not so much what you want to happen. I mean, I, both of us, 
think that they need another tackle, don't we? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, again, I want to move Broderick Jones to left tackle and then go draft a right tackle. There's a couple of good ones. I think you can look at that as a potential round one type of option. I know center is certainly a big need as well, but that's how I would approach things personally. But on the flip side, from where we sit right now, should people be shocked if week one, Dan Moore's the starting left tackle and Broderick Jones is the starting right tackle? No, they shouldn't be. But that's why I would I would love to hear right. Omar Khan's thoughts because I think, I think it's an open-ended question of how this team's going to go with things. I think he's going to be real vanilla. when, when, when hope, One of our guys hopefully will ask that, but I, he's probably going to be real vanilla with that. What would you want to hear from Omar Khan? What's something that you hope to hear? Again, putting quarterback aside because we know that's going to dominate the conversation. I want him to come out and say, we're going to spend a top three <laughs> draft pick, <laughs> one of our top three set selections on a tackle. In fact, uh, for Steeders Depot listener or readers only, uh, we are going to go center tackle with the first two uh, <laughs> pick, picks of the draft. That, 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 that's what I hope to hear. Yeah. And then you woke up and from your right. dream that you had. Because, right, right. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, I want to hear his thoughts on Patrick Peterson too. I just want to get his his confirmation. Is he, I think the way that he talks about it may indicate which way they're leaning in towards of keeping or moving on from him. Okay, that's another good one on top of it there. So uh, anyway, uh, he he will speak tomorrow, and we should have more to talk about from what Omar Khan says, not only in the public media session, but hopefully the uh, the more private uh, media session as well when we get together on Wednesday. Right. So we'll talk about that Wednesday, wrapping up the show here. A couple quick notes. Again, mentioned this with Josh, but the coaching hires, the most notable ones that Pittsburgh made, uh, hiring Matt Baker as an offensive assistant. He's got good ties to Arthur Smith and kind of Tom Arth as well. And then Mike Sullivan, a new title for Mike Sullivan, senior offensive assistant after being the team's quarterbacks coach the last three seasons. Okay. Uh, interesting designation for Mike Sullivan. Uh, what, what exactly do you do here? Yeah. Do you think uh, it's a promotion? Some said it was a promotion. At least that's how they're interpreting it. I don't interpret it that way. I, I don't. I don't. Especially when you have a guy coming in to basically, I mean, he's not an offensive coordinator. He's not right. not technically the quarterback's coach any, I, anymore. It's, uh, it's more like we got to pay you one more year and we're going to put this title on you and, and <laughs> take, take, take some of your input here. That's how I view it as well, but that's the news on the coaching hires. All right, Dave, anything else here to cover we did not discuss, or do you want to get to some reader emails and close out today's show? I know we have plenty of emails, I'm sure, logged to uh, to read. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump into some emails here, and uh, I can tell you right now, Brett Nile. Come on, Brett, you've done this long enough. You can't send in 500, 500 word questions. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll look at I'll, I'll I'll hit the very first thing. Brett, these are too long, brother. You got to shorten these up. Uh, looking at uh, this year's draft class so far, it looks like the Steelers really have an opportunity to fix their offensive line. This is like a five-part question here. Uh, overall, uh, do you see tackle and center as two of the best and deepest positions in this year's draft? He says, to me, I think tackle and center should be two out of the first three picks. Well, we just talked. Uh, a minute ago that I wish Omar Khan would tell me that he'd draft center and tackle in, in, in any of those two orders with his first two picks. Uh, is this the deepest those two positions have been in years? It's too early for me to sit here and, and, and say that overall. I, I'll tell you this. I mean, uh, I think the center position goes at least four deep, wouldn't you, Alex? Yeah, I mean, depending on how you classify Barton, who's kind of played a couple different positions at Duke, but him... Powers Johnson, Frazier, Van Pran Granger. You know, again, I think Matt Lee from Miami, Florida is a real solid. Light, ain't he? Product. He, he is. He's like 288. So I'm not saying I'm not saying to Pittsburgh necessarily. Although, I mean, listen, the, the Arthur Smith drafted Drew Dahlman in Atlanta and he was like 290 something. So he wasn't a particularly big guy. Um, but I just, yeah, top to bottom, I think center is good. And then I think tackle, it, you know, it, you don't want to be prisoner of the moment, but I, it certainly it's much deeper than last year. Last year was shallow. It had good names right. on the top. That's why Pittsburgh moved up for Broderick Jones. Was, there was a big drop off after Paris Johnson, Darnell Wright, and then Jones. The next guy was Anton Harrison. This year you got, you know, seven, eight guys that can really litter the entire first round as opposed to kind of being kind of concentrated to the uh, top 15 picks. Remember last year, we had quite a few of those guys in the top six or seven tackles that were kind of wondering, is he going to move to guard? And- yeah. Bergeron and those types. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and it feels like uh, 
it feels like you can at least get six or seven deep for you at the tackle position where you start having those kind of conversations this year, right? Exactly. So, look, if from where I sit right now, uh, it, uh, uh, Brett, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. Once again, if this team went center tackle first in, in whatever order with, with their first two picks. Yeah, and I think as we sit here relatively early, but that there's a there's a decent chance that occurs. But again, how do they feel about Dan Moore? What's their thoughts on the tackle situation? Do they want to move Jones over? Those are, I think, big, important questions. Uh, shorten those up, uh, Brett. Uh, let's see. Eric uh, Coakley writes in, David Knox, I've wondered for a while, why do the Steelers continue to rely on restructuring contracts for cap compliance? Aren't there penalties and risks that come with it? It feels to me like being behind on credit card debt and continue to transfer their balance to to a new card. Can you explain the negatives of restructures short and long term? It seems like we do this every offseason, Eric. But uh, look, there's there's not. There's probably not going when you look at the entire land, you've we follow the Steelers and we're hyper focused on the Steelers. Uh, and very few of you that listen to this probably care what other teams do overall. But it's I, I think on a year to year basis, I, I don't know what these numbers are. I'd have to research it as well, too. But there are very few teams that probably don't do at least one some sort of restructured contract during the offseason. Uh, it's just part of the process. It's ways to free up, uh, cap money and all. And yes, you can, you can talk about it being pushing off payment for credit card debt. And I, I, I get all that, but it's, to me, it's also, uh, the cost of doing business overall and, and maximizing cash versus cap expenditures. He says, can you explain the negatives of restructures short and long? The negatives uh, are obviously if you restructure a guy and you push out uh, some more of that proration money in the cap, you obviously would like to see him play out the remaining years uh, of that deal. And, 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 and uh, at, at the very least now uh, uh, what a player earns in cash every year is, is the long and short of it. So you might get in a situation you know, let, let's look at Cam Hayward's uh, situation uh, uh, this year, uh, because obviously he's he has had uh, some restructures done to his contract since it was, uh, you know, uh, 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 originally signed there. Uh, Cam Hayward is it has a cap number of twenty two point four oh six million. Uh, a little bit more than that this year. People will automatically look at that first and foremost. The way you look at a player on any given year should be what he's going to earn in cash that year, and is he worth that number? Stop looking at the cap number. Uh, the question with Cat with, with Cam Hayward is: Is he worth sixteen million dollars this year? Uh, half of you probably listening to this, maybe even more than half, probably saying no. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the other bit of you saying, hell yeah, he's worth $16 million uh, 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 in 2024. That's the number that matters right now. Now, if they extend his contract and don't give him any new money uh, this year, uh, he's the, the, the end result of that is he's still going to get his $16 million in 2024. The, the problem is, is that a bulk of that $16 million will be given to him uh, as a signing bonus, which means that has to be prorated out into potential 2025 and 2026, maybe years. And then you worry about, is 2024 going to be uh, his final season? If, however, comma, you think that you can... Through this, through this, let's let's assume this extension happens the way I think it will in two years. No new money in 2024. You come up with an acceptable uh, cash earnings for him in 2025 of less than 16 million. Uh, there, the hope is that you do this with the idea of at least getting an additional year out of him in 2025. Now it's not mandatory because obviously you need the cap room now uh, with him uh, or, or could use the cap room now with him. So, I mean, you were the way you get it yourself into problems with, with extension, no new money extensions or restructures overall is you are pushing out further prorated cap money that could very easily become dead. If the player does not, 
uh, uh, play out their years there. So there are pros and cons with it. it will, we, will, we will forever be talking about don't like people not liking the way they do. But look, this team has restructured a lot. Look at last year with a guy like TJ Watt, Alex. You know, there was a time at this point of the offseason last year where I thought it was probably 96% chance that they were going to restructure the contract to TJ Watt. They didn't have to. And they didn't, you know. Uh, They didn't have to do that. So there was restraint uh, when it comes to that. Now, what did they they end up doing with, uh, with, 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 with Mitch Trubisky? You know, uh, that was a forced restructure, forced restructure extension, call it whatever you want, but he did not get any new money. All they did was move around money. They gave him his $8 million in 2023. They just moved it around and now they're paying for it as part of proration uh, uh, in dead money after having to cutting, cutting him last year. So uh, you can say they, they, they had restraint in one area, but then they turned around with Mr. Bisky and, you know, uh, essentially set them up themselves up for guaranteed dead money. So uh, once again, uh, watch every team this off season and tell me how many teams don't restructure at least one contract or don't at least uh, have one no new money extension for an older veteran to lower his cap charge in 2024. Did I explain all that good? You did, and that number is about zero. And again, one thing Pittsburgh does not do that's becoming pretty commonplace around the NFL besides the COVID year, which was obviously a rare exception, are the voidable year contracts, which has which obviously will create more dead money. And that's kind of known when you, when that contract gets gets created. And you know, Baltimore's got some that dead money, you know, for voidable years and deals in Pittsburgh really does not seem to to do that again besides the, the COVID year. All right, uh, Chris Warren writes in, we need to have another solid draft. We expect to take a solid step forward this season. In my opinion, we need to prioritize the center and inside linebacker positions. In the, in the first two rounds, he writes, the Steelers expect elite play from the center position. It just hasn't been there in recent years. And while there are lots of inside linebackers in the draft, we need a guy that can cover. And most of the options I'm seeing are downhill types that we already have on the roster. I would like to see this go, uh, go get a solid cornerback in free agency. Then if only, uh, our draft would go something like, and then he's got an example where he's got Jackson Powers Johnson, uh, Chiron. Oh, I don't, I haven't even seen any of this guy's tape yet. Uh, uh, he's got Cedric Gray, the linebacker out of North Carolina at 51 and at 84. He's got, uh, who's the yell? How do you pronounce the yell tackles, uh, last name? Oh, and, God. Uh, Armor, 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 Armor Gajayi or something yeah, like that. I, the yell, yell tackle, though, I got yeah, you. Yeah, I haven't even watched any of his tape yet. Uh, he's got him at 84. Uh, at 120, he's got um, um, Masson Smith, uh, the defensive tackle out of LSU. Another guy I have, not watched, I have not watched yet. And at 121st overall, he's got Thomas Harper, safety out of Notre Dame. So uh, that's his suggestions there. Uh, look, we're, you know, we're obviously going to get deeper and deeper into some of these guys uh, as we go along. How many draft profiles we got up already, Alex? Uh, about 110 or so. Right. So we are moving right along. All right. Uh, last one from Jeff Arbogas writes in. Hello, guys. Believe it or not, uh, y'all are a bastion of sanity in this silly season of football. All these quarterback trades being proposed are killing me, he says. Do you think the Steelers add to the tight end room with an old school blocking first receiving uh, second type player? If so, where does that leave Connor Hayward, uh, Jeff from West Virginia? I, look, I I would be surprised if they do anything really significant at, at the tight end uh, position. I mean, you got Pat Firemuth, who they seem to like, probably going to get an extension this offseason. Obviously, uh, drafted uh, a, a blocking component in Darnell Washington last year. Uh, Connor Hayward is a jack of all trades that can that probably – could even get more targets and a little bit more snap count with uh, Arthur Smith as OC. And a lot of people forget about hot rod, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's, that's going to be a forgotten guy. I think moving forward into this off season, because a Rodney Williams uh, uh, seems to be a Danny Smith favorite, and that does not hurt. And number B, Rodney Williams is kind of that guy that you can move around. And if you wanted to, to play around with some personnel groupings that include three tight ends on the field, he could do a little bit in the blocking component aspect of it, but he's like having a big, an oversized receiver out there as well too. So uh, don't, 
uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say Rodney Williams ends up making a 53 man roster uh, when it's all said and done. But on the flip side, people slept on him last year and he stuck the, basically the whole season uh, on the roster. And with the with the slant with this with his team go, went with offensive coordinator and how we expect the usage of, of multiple tight ends to be. Yeah, he's not an old school blocking first uh, tight end, but. There are maybe more ways to get him on the field along with Connor Hayward uh, moving forward. So long story short, I would, you know, they might add a, a, a more true fullback as Alex, right. I think, uh, has pointed out several times since uh, Arthur Smith was 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 hired. I think you could could see that being an addition that might impact a guy like a Rodney Williams or something like that. But uh, I, I would be surprised if, if, if we have a notable tight end added. I agree. And yeah, Williams is a really interesting name that should not be forgotten. And I'm not, I'm not calling him the next, this guy, but he's got a similar profile and bill to a Delaney Walker, or John U. Smith, who, you know, Arthur Smith has had success with Tennessee Amen. and Smith and Tennessee and Atlanta. So I, I can see that now with Hayward. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I think he can be used in the boot game and, and be flexed out and some red zone type work. Will he get some fullback opportunities? He could, he's not that traditional true blocking fullback, like a Keith Smith that, uh, Smith had in Atlanta the past three years. So interested to see what happens to Hayward. But I think generally speaking, they they will look for a true fullback type. That's probably how they'll really handle adding to the tight end fullback room. All right. Uh, I think we got through most of it there. I think we're coming up on two hours. We got a thin staff today that we got to help cover because of combine getting on the way and people on the road. Uh, Alex, I uh, hope I sound a little bit better as, as, as I went on here uh, today, my first show back. You did. And if people were wondering, could we still pull off almost two hours after a week off? We, we still got it, Dave. Like riding a bike. Yeah, I could pull off two hours, uh, no problem. Even if you get even half a voice there. So, uh, <laughs> all right, uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. We'll have a lot of uh, combine stuff, I'm sure, to talk about. I think you've got an article going up either today or tomorrow about some combine stuff. Uh, Omar Khan will meet the media on Tuesday. That should give us plenty to talk about. And uh, who knows? Maybe there'll be another transaction or two, or or or, 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 or contract termination for us to talk about uh, as well. So. Uh, Hope everybody enjoyed that today. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigation bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button. I still got all that. I still remember all that. I wasn't <laughs> gone too long there. All right. Until Wednesday. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.